Thank you everyone for being here. So today is the kind of final part of stage four breast cancer. We're gonna talk about treating patients with triple negative breast cancers today. It's an important discussion for those that this pertains to. We're gonna talk about that in a moment, but I sincerely appreciate everyone being here. Again, audience participation is always encouraged. Please ask any questions that you might have. I absolutely wanna hear from you. This is not meant to be a one person diatribe. It's meant to be a dialogue. And so please, 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 ask anything that you'd like to ask. So again, when we talk about why I did this series, and I just did this last week and discussed this a little bit, but when patients are diagnosed with cancer, right, they go through the gamut of emotions, they go through anxiety, stress, phobia, shame, depression. That's a normal response. You know, a lot of people ask me about depression in the context of cancer, and we know that over 40% of patients with the diagnosis of cancer get depressed. That That's a understandable phenomenon, right? But I always tell people that depression to me is an abnormal response to either a normal or abnormal situation. Whereas sadness, melancholy, is a normal response to an abnormal situation. And so, you know, when you get diagnosed with cancer, there's nothing normal about that. So to feel sad to me is completely normal. That is well within the realm of possibilities of emotions. I, I would be shocked if you didn't have sadness and concerns in that regard. And so this series is really based on the notion that we want to confront those emotions. And we're gonna do that in future entries in this series in a way that's remarkable. We're gonna really do psycho-oncology. My brother's a psychiatrist. He's really gonna discuss the psychology of cancer. But today, and the whole purpose of, of these last several talks has been to try and confront the fear of the unknown, right? When you get diagnosed with cancer, there's a profound fear of the unknown, what's going to happen to you. And so much of what we've been doing since we started this series was to try and remove the curtain from what's about to happen to you, to really shed light on what theoretically is unknown in this moment. So we're going to walk you through your road, your path, your personalized journey. So today, we're going to talk very specifically about patients with stage four triple negative breast cancer. In the last several entries to this series, we talked about other patients with breast cancer stage four that had different protein expression profiles. Today, we're going to really hone in on patients who have triple negative breast cancers. So for those patients, for everyone watching today who this pertains to, what I would like you to do is to watch three parts of the breast cancer slash if you were my family member series. So initially, watch the talk that we basically called Optimizing Your Ability to Fight Cancer. That talk is an incredible overview for everyone with cancer, not just breast cancer, but it will give you a foundation upon which to really learn the rest of what you need to know. The second talk I want you to watch is part one of this series, stage four breast cancer. That's the overview, the breast cancer overview that really sets you up for today where we talk about treatment of your specific disease, your triple negative breast cancer. You can watch these lectures at revolutioncancer.com. It's all free. You can watch it on the Revolution Cancer channel on youtube.com, also, also all free. So let's talk about your personalized journey today. And that's really what these series have been about. You know, anyone can talk about breast cancer in general, but you don't really want to hear about breast cancer in general. You want to hear about what applies to you. You want to know what you're going to experience. It's all about your journey and your fear of the unknown. And we want to really remove the unknown part of this equation as much as we can. So as, we, as you know, we've discussed this before, for anyone that's watched previous lectures, there are three proteins of interest when we see patients with breast cancer. We wanna know if your breast cancer cell makes these three proteins. So we talked about the estrogen receptor, which oftentimes breast cancer cells will make and will allow them to be responsive to estrogen, to grow in the presence of estrogen. We talked about the progesterone receptor, which allows these cells to grow in the context of progesterone. And we talked about a protein called HER2. I want you to go back to the breast cancer overview talk to really revisit us. But the bottom line is if you're here, your cancer really doesn't make any of these three proteins. It's what we call triple negative. It doesn't make the estrogen receptor, it doesn't make the progesterone receptor, and it doesn't make HER2. So over the last couple of weeks, we've really gone through the entire gamut of stage four breast cancer. The talk we gave two weeks ago talked about patients who either made the estrogen receptor and or the progesterone receptor and were either HER2 negative or low HER2 positive. The talk we gave last week really focused on patients who were HER2 positive, those are in yellow, 
And today we're going to talk about patients who are in green. We're going to talk about patients who don't make any of these three proteins or patients who make a little bit of HER2 but are still considered HER2 negative by conventional theory at the moment. So they're typically, they're hormone receptor negative, estrogen receptor, receptor and progesterone receptor negative, and they might make a little bit of HER2, but we still call that triple negative at least today. So we're really talking about patients in green and we're really focused on triple negative breast cancers. So when we talk about stage four triple negative breast cancer, what you need to appreciate is first of all, you're not alone, right? So 10 to 20% of patients with breast cancer have triple negative breast cancer. So please, 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 you are not, no, you're not alone. Now, the other thing I want you to know is that this is the toughest breast cancer to treat. This is the one we get most nervous about as doctors. When we do a biopsy and we see the result and it says that you're triple negative, that's when we say, okay, we know that we're going to be in for a tougher fight. We know that we have to think a little bit differently about the cancer you have. And the reason for that is because these are notoriously aggressive and they're tough to treat. They are infamously resistant to treatments that we use. So the median overall survival is about 13 to 14 months. Essentially what that means is 50% of people are alive beyond 13 to 14 months. Now, I wanna take a step back. So far in this series, no one has heard me talk about numbers. I really haven't talked about death. I really haven't talked about people dying. I haven't talked about how long people will live. And I debated a lot about talking about this. I really hate talking about numbers. And I think I've said this before, but when patients ask me how long they have left to live, that's the number one question they should ask. That's a really important question, but it's the question I despise the most because I'm not thinking about you dying, right? I'm thinking about keeping you alive with the best quality of life for a very long time. I'm not thinking about death. So I really don't talk numbers. And part of the reason I don't talk numbers is because I think that the studies that display these numbers are not that great. They don't take into account all the new trials, all the new drugs that we're attempting to use. And they really don't necessarily refer to your specific oncologist. Your oncologist might have a little bit of different techniques. So, you know, these numbers are not necessarily applicable to everybody. But I do think the, the reason why it's important to talk about this number today is because I want to emphasize that because the number is 13 to 14 months, you have to think differently. This is incredibly important for triple negative breast cancers because this number is not attractive. It's not appealing. We want you to live for a very long time. 13 to 14 months just isn't going to get it done. And so I don't want you to fixate on that number. To me, that number is meaningless. Many, many people live way beyond that. The only thing I want you to take away from that number is that we have to think a little bit differently because we want to do much, much better than that. Now, the key here is with that in mind that you don't have an expiration date. And that's the key. I don't talk about numbers. I already said that. I hate talking about them because I don't think patients have an expiration date. They don't walk in the door with an expiration label saying, I'm going to die in 13 months. That's complete garbage. That does not happen, right? And so my thought process is very simply, how do I make sure you live for a very long time with a good quiet life? Now to do that with stage four triple negative breast cancer, chemotherapy is going to be very, very important. Chemotherapy is definitely going to be part of your treatment. That's slightly different than people with other types of breast cancer, with other types of protein expression profiles, where chemotherapy may not be as important for their treatment initially. For you, chemotherapy is going to be central to your treatment right away. And we're going to talk about that extensively. We're going to talk about chemotherapy today. In addition, and this is incredibly important, clinical trials and molecular profiling are imperative. When we talk about stage four triple negative breast cancer that has a median overall survival of roughly 13 to 14 months, we immediately think to ourselves, we have to do better. That's not good enough. So we immediately think about clinical trials. We think, okay, what clinical trials are available to you to make sure that you do better than that? And we also think about characterizing your cancer at the genomic and the protein level, which we'll talk about in a moment, because we are looking for different ways to treat your cancer to optimize your chances of living very, very long. So I want you to appreciate that this number to me does not matter. Okay, I don't care about it. Please don't perseverate on it. It's not important. What is important is that because our treatments are not that great at the moment, you have to think outside the box. You need to think about clinical trials. You need to think about molecular profiling. I'm emphasizing that today much more than I have the last couple of talks because it matters more with triple negative breast cancer. So 
The other fundamental thing that you need to appreciate is that no two stage four triple negative breast cancer are the same. You've heard me say this many, many times now, but I am a firm believer in this. When patients come with stage four triple negative breast cancer, we typically think of them as being aggressive. They're normally over here on a continuum of very highly aggressive to fairly indolent, slow growing. Okay, they're normally over here. That's why we worry about triple negative breast cancers. But there are some that will grow relatively slowly. So you might be over here on this continuum of aggressiveness regarding stage four triple negative breast cancers. Just appreciate that no two stage four triple negative breast cancers are the same. Don't compare yourself to someone else. It doesn't make sense. Your cancer is unique. It has a different growth rate. There will be different amounts of cancer. You know, it might be in the bones. It might be in the lungs. It might be in the liver. Might, so where it is located matters. The location could be different. And then the amount of cancer may be different. There might be a lot of cancer out there. There might be a little bit of cancer out there. So just appreciate that you're going to have a very different stage four triple negative breast cancer than the person next to you who has a triple negative breast cancer. It will, you'll have different amounts of disease, different location, different growth rate. And I want you to understand that. I don't really want you comparing yourself to other people. What you're gonna do based on that though, is you're gonna say, okay, I wanna understand my specific cancer. How fast does my cancer grow? How well does it respond to certain treatments? Where is it located? How much is there? That's what I want you thinking about. I want you to say to your doctor, I wanna see the scan because I wanna know what my specific stage four triple negative breast cancer looks like. Where is the cancer? Is it in my bones? Is it in the liver? Is it in the lungs? Show me my scan. I wanna know exactly where my cancer is. And I wanna know how much is out there. The other thing I want you thinking about is trends, not snapshots. Now I've said this before, but when patients ask me how long they have left to live, and it's the first time I'm meeting them, I'm looking at their scan for the first time, I always tell them I have no idea. And the reason I have no idea is because I need to understand your cancer and where it is on this continuum before I can give you any sort of answer regarding how long you have to left to live. And I already told you, I don't even have an answer for that in general, because I don't think you have an expiration date. But if you're asking me what your cancer is going to do, the only way I'll ever really know that for the most part is by looking at the next scan. So you come to me today, I treat you. If the next scan looks amazing, well, we're in a great position. If it doesn't look as great, well, that's a very different position. And we can start talking about what that means. With that said, I will say sometimes when patients walk in the door and the cancer's everywhere and you're dealing with a triple negative breast cancer, you kind of know where you are in that situation. So sometimes the snapshot can give you part of the answer, but even then you still want to see the next scan. So I want you to appreciate that. First of all, your stage four triple negative breast cancer is unlike any other. I want you to see your scans. I want you to pin your doctor down and say, show me the pictures, show me the pictures. I want you to also appreciate that you do not have an expiration date. You do not have an expiration date. I want you thinking about clinical trials. I want you thinking about molecular profiling. And I want you thinking in terms of trends, not snapshots. Today might look quite bad, but three months from now might look amazing. So to that end, I want you to ask to see your scans. Both of these patients have breast cancer, but you can see the amount of disease is very different. This patient has a couple spots in the liver. You can see that here. They have one lymph node in the middle of the chest, another lymph node here. This is actually the kidneys. That's normal. That is not cancer. This patient has disease up and down the bones and basically up and down the spine, in the ribs, in the femur. So you can see there's a lot of cancer here. These two patients are not created equal. They're very different in terms of the location of the disease. The disease here is in the bones, this is in the liver. And in terms of the amount of cancer, there's a lot more cancer on this scan than there is on this one. I want you to see your scans. I want you to know where your cancer is. The other reason for that, aside from just having a fundamental understanding of your cancer, is to understand your symptoms. Imagine if you come in with lower back pain. You tell me you have pain in the lower back. Let's say this location here. Well, if you have pain in the lower back and I look at this scan, I don't see any cancer in your lower back here. So I would say, okay, that's probably not cancer. Whereas if you had this scan and I saw this sort of appearance in the bone, I would say, yeah, that's probably cancer causing pain. That's two very different phenomena. We treat those things very, very differently with very different perspectives on those, and so would you. So seeing your scan matters a lot in terms of understanding your symptoms and understanding your specific cancer. Now, I say this a lot, and I wrote this article for bioformatron.com. I think a lot of people have now read this. 
I am always playing chess against cancer. I never, ever play checkers. And I want you to, too. I want you to see several moves ahead. I want you thinking about what is the contingency plan? What's the worst case scenario? How do I plan for it? So to do that, you really need to think like this. So I termed this, well, I coined this term called treatment cartography. The idea of making specific treatment maps for every single patient in a personalized way. And so what we do with patients with stage four triple negative breast cancer is we use a first line treatment. So the first treatment we use, we use it until it stops working. And then we use a second line treatment. And then if that stops working, you progress on it or you don't tolerate it, we use a third line treatment and so on and so forth. So the first moment that I'm meeting patients, the very first moment I meet them and they have a stage four triple negative breast cancer, I'm thinking about what's my first line approach, my second line approach, my third line approach, my fourth line approach. I'm thinking well ahead to the in the future because I want to get you years, not months, right? So I'm thinking about how do I get you a significant amount of time with a good quality of life? And I'm always thinking ahead. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm thinking about clinical trials. I'm thinking about molecular profiling. I'm thinking about all these different options that I would like to use to try and prolong your life. And what I'm really doing is I'm using this algorithm here. So I want you to think about this acronym. It's the COMET acronym. So basically what it means is there's kind of five broad categories of treatments, of therapeutics. There's conventional treatments, which basically refers to drugs that are already approved by the FDA to treat your cancer, things like chemotherapy and immunotherapy. There's operational considerations. So is there a way to do surgery that would be beneficial? There are molecular-based options. So when we test your cancer at the genetic level and at the protein level, is there anything your cancer cells are telling us that we can use to attack it? Attack it? Is there something about their molecular profile that makes them susceptible to using certain drugs? We look at clinical trials. So this is really important. We'll talk about this in a moment. And then we think about everything else. Is there a role for radiation? Is there a role, role for what we call radioembolization, really radiation? So treatments that we give locally to treat specific areas of your cancer if they're causing pain or something like that. And what we do is we say, okay, let's look at this COMET acronym and let's say, okay, what are our conventional options? What are the treatments that are FDA approved for stage four triple negative breast cancer? What are our clinical trial options? Which clinical trials are you eligible for? What are our molecular-based options? So after we test your cancer, what did your cancer cell tell us we could use in terms of particular drugs to attack it? And then what are the local regional options? Is there a role for radiation? Is there a role for surgery? So this is kind of how we think. And then what we do is we say, okay, what is the best sequence for you? What's the best first line approach? What would be the se best second line approach? What's the best third line approach? And so on and so forth. Now, why is this important? Why does it matter? Well, the reason it matters is because if there's a clinical trial that I think is great, there's a drug there that I want you to eventually be treated with, then if I'm gonna position that here in the third treatment, the third line, right? I have to be careful about what I do in the first two lines because if I give you a drug in the first line that makes you ineligible for that trial later, well, now I can't use the trial in third line. So it's really important to think about your treatment map at the very first moment you walk in the door. Now, for you, it's not that important, right? It's a stage four breast cancer patient. You don't need to think like that in that instance. The doctor should be doing that for you. But I want you to think about playing chess against cancer. And I want you asking your doctor about this acronym. I want you to say to them, hey, what are the conventional options here? What are the surgical options? Did you do the molecular profiling? What did that show? What clinical trials are available to me? This is the part I want you to do. I want you to ask them about to really get them thinking about this treatment map so you can understand it. Let's talk about molecular profiling for a moment. Now, I want you to really go back to the very first talk I gave, which is part one of this series, and really look at that because that's where I explain this the most. But the bottom line is I want you asking about these things in green. I want you to ask your physician about NGS. We call that next generation sequencing. I'm going to ask them about PDL1 testing. I want you to ask them about tumor mutation burden testing, TMB. I want you asking about microsatellite instability testing, MSI. And I want you asking about homologous recombination deficiency testing. Now, the reason I want you asking about that is because sometimes when we do these tests on your cancer, something we call molecular profiling, they can reveal different 
issues with your cancer that render them susceptible to various drugs we can use. So we are looking for weaknesses in your cancer that we can attack. For example, when we do next generation sequencing, we are looking for mutations in the DNA of your cancer. And the idea is if we find, say, a purple mutation in the DNA, that would allow us to use a purple drug that targets it. If we find a green mutation, we could use a green drug, orange mutation, and orange drug. So I want you asking about next generation sequencing. Did they do it? And did they find any mutations in your cancer that are useful for you, that would allow you to use drugs that are not conventionally used in stage four triple negative breast cancer? The reason we look talk about PDL1, TMB, and MSI is because if these are high, if your PDL1 high or TMB high or MSI high, it lets us use immunotherapy, which is where we basically rev up the immune system to attack your cancer cells. We'll talk about that in a moment. If you have a high level of what we call homologous recombination deficiency, then it allows us to use a drug called a PARP inhibitor. Again, please go back to the initial talks we gave here. You'll be able to learn this a little bit more, but the bottom line is all I want you to do is to say to your doctor, did you do molecular profiling? And what did it show? Just look at the report. Were there any drugs that came to light from that profiling that we can now use, which we would not have been able to use before? That's what I want you asking about. Let's talk about immunotherapy for a moment. So many people have been hearing about immunotherapy. You know, it's been all over the news. It's been all over commercials. It's been around for a long time now. So the idea behind, immuno, behind immunotherapy is that we give patients drugs to stimulate the immune system, to recognize the cancer as foreign and to attack it, to eradicate it. And so we're really trying to bolster the immune system to attack your cancer. Immune therapy is essential in many different types of cancers. We're gonna talk about it specifically today for you, for patients with stage four triple negative breast cancers where it is useful for some of you. Now, to determine if you're a candidate for immunotherapy with stage four triple negative breast cancer, you need to appreciate a protein called PDL1. So I'm gonna talk about it for a moment, not hard, just stay with me. I'm gonna make this really simple. The idea is that the cancer cell, which is here in green, sometimes makes a protein called PDL1 here in blue. And what happens when it makes that protein and inserts it on its surface is that protein can basically bind to a protein on the immune system cell here in blue called PD1. When you have that binding take place, what essentially happens is the tumor cell basically turns off the immune system cell. So the immune system cell cannot recognize it as foreign, and attack it. So it's basically inhibiting the immune system cell by making this protein pd one which interacts with PD-1 on the immune system cell surface. So the idea behind immune therapy, okay, is that immune therapy, which is here in red, will basically bind to the pd one that's on the surface of the cancer cell, prevent it from turning off the immune system cell so that the immune system cell can say, wait a second, the cancer cell is not supposed to be here and attack it. You can see this cancer cell in green is dying. And so in stage four triple negative breast cancer, we use an immunotherapy called Keytruda, otherwise known as pembrolizumab, if 10% or more of your cancer cells make PDL1. So I want you to ask your doctor if your cancer cells make PDL1 and how many do. And if 10% or more make it, I want you to ask your cancer doctor if they're going to give you Keytruda. We're going to talk about that more today, but that's all I want you to take away from this. Ask them about PDL1 if you have stage four triple negative breast cancer, and ask them how many of the cancer cells make it. Make sure they tested for it, and make sure it's temp if it's ten percent or more that they're going to consider giving you Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. So we talked about this just a moment ago, but when we sit down with patients who have stage four triple negative breast cancer, and we try and determine if we wanna give them immune therapy, if they're a good candidate for immune therapy, what we're looking at is PDL1. If their PDL1 is 10% or more, we're likely going to use a drug that stimulates our immune system to attack the cancer and eradicate it, like Keytruda. In addition, there's two other considerations here. Now, I talked about this a little bit earlier, and certainly in the other talks, the overview talk, which I would like you to watch, I talk about this a lot. But the idea here is if your cancer has a lot of DNA instability, which basically manifests as something we call MSI high, microcellular instability high, or there's a lot of mutations in it, 
we call that tumor mutation burden, if that's really high, then your cancer is more than likely or more likely going to respond to immune therapy. We would consider using immune therapy in patients who have a high level of microcell instability or a high tumor mutation burden. So these three characteristics are what I want you asking your physician about. You don't have to know this today. I don't care if you remember any of this. Just write down what I put down here in red. Ask your physician about PDL1, MSI, and TMB. And if they're high at all, ask about immune therapy because you would be a candidate. Why does it matter? Well, this picture I think I showed in the overview talk, but this is a resounding picture. Here's a patient with stage four triple negative breast cancer with abnormal cancer in their lymph nodes by the aorta, also an area here where there's cancer by the psoas muscle in their abdomen. And you can see that their tumor mutation burden, TMB was high. It was 76, it should be 10 or less. So it was high. And because they were TMB high, their physician gave them immune therapy. There's an immune therapy called nivolumab, just like pembrolizumab, like Keytruda. They gave them the immune therapy, and you can see that these lymph nodes that were by the aorta were gone in two months. You don't see them anymore. They're gone. This is actually just the inferior vena cava that's normal. In addition, the lymph node by the psoas muscle was also gone. So this patient here is now in a complete remission. If you look at their scans, you don't see any cancer. They're in a complete remission. But more importantly, not only were they in a complete remission in just two months, they're in a complete remission four years later. They still don't have evidence of cancer on this drug that's incredibly safe. Immune therapy is incredibly safe. So their physician gave them four years of extra life because they did the molecular profiling and they looked for that tumor mutation burden testing. They looked for that value. That's why it's so important. If, your doc if their doctor in this case failed to do that, failed to look for the TMB, they would have missed the opportunity to use immune therapy and they would have basically cost this patient four years of life where they had no cancer on their skin and they have a tremendous quality of life because the drug is really safe. That's why it's important. That's why I want you asking about it. The other thing I wanna talk about here is this HRD concept, homologous recombination deficiency. So this gets a little complicated. And I've done this before a couple of times, but I'm gonna go over it a little bit today because it matters. When we basically age and as we're alive, we have stem cells in our body that need to divide to replenish other cells in our body, okay? But during that cell division process, when one parent cell becomes two daughter cells that are exact replicates of the parent cell, the DNA needs to be replicated, okay? The DNA from the parent cell needs to be given to each daughter cell and needs to be an exact copy. The problem is during the replication of that DNA, there are some inaccuracies that can happen. That process is not perfectly accurate. There's some infidelity. So there are some mutations that can occur. The body has a slew of protein and a slew of different mechanisms to repair those mutations so they do not become a problem later, right? Otherwise we'd be in a lot of trouble. One of those processes is called homologous recombination. It helps remedy errors in the DNA. That's really important. Now, there are patients who have mutations in the proteins or the DNA that make these proteins that help remedy these mutation errors that are involved in homologous recombination. Two of these genes, which I'm sure you probably heard about, are BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are really, really important genes because they make BRCA1 and BRCA2 proteins that are involved in repairing DNA. So if you have a mutation in these particular proteins, then you have what's called homologous recombination deficiency. You're not really able to perform this homologous recombination process properly. And what's good about that is that when patients have these mutations, they are eligible to receive drugs called PARP inhibitors, like Elaparib. It's a drug called, it's a poly ADP ribose polymerase inhibitor, PARP inhibitor, which is Elaparib. This is otherwise known as Lumparza. And the reason that matters is because it can work wonders in patients who have these mutations. So here's a patient with a BRCA2 mutation, and you can see that this patient got Elaparib. So initially they came in, they had cancer in the right breast, they had cancer in the lung, you can see that here in cancer in the other side of the lung, the left side of the lung, it's reversed. And after getting a lapper, because they had this BRCA2 mutation, you can see that the spot in the lung is gone, the spot in the other lung is gone, 
and the spot in the breast has cleared. So that's why it matters. If you have a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation in your cancer cell, which they can test by doing the molecular profile we talked about earlier, then you would be eligible for a drug called Alaparib. It would be another great option for you, which is why I want you to ask about it. So this is critically important. So ultimately, when we kind of conclude here, when we talk about molecular profiling, what I want you to understand is that you need to be your own hero. You need to ask about this. Some breast cancer doctors are not doing this routinely. I think you need to ask about it. Don't worry about the details. Just ask about molecular profiling. Ask about what's in red here. So NGS, PDL1, TMB, MSI, and HRD. And just tell your doctor that you'd like to see the results and you'd like to know if it was useful in your case. Another thing that's really important in stage four triple negative breast cancer is clinical trials. So clinical trials are where we take drugs that are not currently approved or not approved in a certain scenario for your cancer. And we test them to see if they'd be useful for stage four triple negative breast cancer. They are essentially experiments designed to save lives and they oftentimes provide hope where there was none. For stage four triple negative breast cancer, there is absolutely no question. You need to look at clinical trials and ideally get on one. I think that every single patient with stage four triple negative breast cancer has to think like this. It's really important. It's an essential component of everyone's treatment map and I would constantly ask your oncologist about it. So every couple of months and say, hey, is there a new clinical trial for me? Is there something else we can do here? And you can even go to clinicaltrials.gov yourself and you can look at clinical trials yourself and you can research it yourself. Just put in stage four triple negative breast cancer in the search box and look at it yourself. Go to the initial talk, the one that's called optimizing your fight against cancer, optimizing your ability to fight cancer. And that talk really ex ex exemplifies this and explicitly tells you how to do this. But clinical trials are incredibly important. So revisiting your journey and walking you through your journey as a stage four triple negative breast cancer, there's a couple of very important concepts. Number one, your treatment is almost undoubtedly going to involve chemotherapy. For sure, you're going to get chemotherapy. We're going to talk about it in a minute. You will get immune therapy most likely if your PDL1 is 10% or more. So just appreciate that. Just understand that chemotherapy is certainly going to be part of your journey immunotherapy may be depending on the characteristics of your cancer we just talked about. Generally, there's no role for surgery. So we just went over the C part, that's the conventional options. In terms of the operational part of the COMET acronym, generally there's no role for surgery. In terms of molecular-based options, you're gonna ask about your molecular profiling. Hopefully there will be something there that the cancer is susceptible to based on its molecular profile. In terms of everything else, we will oftentimes use radiation for symptom control, but in general, there's not a huge role for radiation unless you've got disease in the brain, which we'll talk about later. And in terms of trials, clinical trials are extremely important. They're extremely important. So when we talk about stage four triple negative breast cancer, we talk about any cancer in general. I always talk about, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is the risk of the treatment worth the potential benefit, the juice that you get? And so I want you always to think about this. And we're gonna talk like that throughout the remainder of this particular discussion. Now, this is kind of what we're about to discuss. This is the forest. It also includes the trees, but this is the forest. I'm gonna break this down. It looks very complicated, but it's really not, okay? So we're gonna talk about chemotherapy for a moment, and then we're gonna go into your personalized journey, which we're gonna discuss in detail. So chemotherapy are drugs that target processes involved in cell division. So cancer is just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. Breast cancer, breast cell, lung cancer, lung cell, colon cancer, colon cell. And so in order for breast cancer cells to divide or any cell to divide, what essentially has to happen is the cell, the parent cell, has to make exact copies of its DNA, right? And then it also needs to grow in a certain way and then split so that it can form two daughter cells in a process we call mitosis, okay? I don't want you to worry too much about that. But what I want you to appreciate is that chemotherapy targets that process. It targets the process we call mitosis, where the cancer cell or the, needs to first make exact copies of its DNA and then basically grow and then allow for each daughter cell to get a copy of the DNA. Now, chemotherapy targets that process and it kills cancer cells in different ways. So these are the types of chemotherapies we typically use for stage four triple negative breast cancer. There are others, but these are some of the main ones. And I don't want you to even think about this. You don't have to remember any of these details. You can reference this particular slide later. You can come back to it. What I've essentially done for you for the most part is given you the brand name 
and the generic name in case you get confused. There's always essentially two names for every drug. But what I want you to take away from this is that number one, there's lots of options. Okay, so there's a lot of hope. We've got a lot of options to treat your stage four triple negative breast cancer. That's one very big take home from this particular slide. Okay. The other thing I want you thinking about is that we have different classes of chemotherapy. And why is that important? The reason I included that here is because I want you to appreciate that these classes of drugs attack the cancer in different ways, right? So the taxanes attack the cancer at the process of where it kind of tries to split into two cells. These drugs here, the anthracyclines, target the process where the cancer cell is trying to replicate its DNA. So they do different things. And the reason that matters is because you don't typically want to use a drug in the same class if the cancer's already figured out one of those drugs in that class. You're going to go to a different class. So I'm always thinking about what have I shown the cancer? What method of attack has it already seen? What has it figured out? And if it's figured out a method of attack, I'm going to use a different method of attack. It's a different class of drug. And that's really what we think about. And that's kind of how I want you to conceptualize this. I don't want you to worry about the details. I want you to appreciate that we have lots of different chemotherapy options, okay? And that the way we think about it is we think about how did this chemotherapy attack the cancer? It certainly seems to have figured that out. So how do we attack it in a different way? And we think about it in terms of these classes of drugs. And that's really important. That's the only take home message from this. And so the other thing to think about though, when we talk about chemotherapy, and this is why people don't like chemotherapy and not can appreciate it, is that it can affect normal cells, right? So chemotherapy targets actively dividing cells. Again, cancer is just a cell that grows in an uncontrolled way. It's typically actively divided. And so the issue with chemotherapy and the reason why there's side effects associated with chemotherapy is because it also attacks normal cells that are actively dividing. We all have stem cells. We have stem cells in our bone marrow. We have stem cells in our skin. We have stem cells in our gut. Those cells classically have to replenish our cells in order for us to stay alive. And so chemotherapy isn't just attacking the cancer cell. It's also having an impact on the normal cell. Now, fortunately, the impact it has on the cancer cells oftentimes much greater than it has on the normal cells, but that's why you see side effects. That's why patients have issues with chemotherapy. And so the other thing I need you to appreciate though, is that the side effect profile of chemotherapy is vastly different depending on the chemotherapy you get. So this class of drugs, we think about the heart. This class of drugs, we think about peripheral nerves. So I just want you to appreciate that the chemotherapies are not created equal. They're very different. They have different side effect profiles. Some are much easier to tolerate, some are harder. They attack the cancer in different ways and they are an essential component of the treatment plan of any stage four triple negative breast cancer patient. You are going to get chemotherapy. It's unavoidable, okay? Now, chemotherapy generally is used as single agent. We use one drug at a time, but some of us use combinations that are useful. I particularly like to use a combination chemotherapy called carboplatin and gemocytobine, that's here. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, one thing I think there might be a little controversy about, but I can tell you that one of my mentors, previous mentors, who was one of the best breast cancer doctors in the world would say this to me all the time. There's no real rule about how to sequence these chemotherapies. There's no right answer here. It's really no wrong answer. Sorry, no right answer or no wrong answer here. If your physician chooses to use a chemotherapy upfront, they're, they're right. There's really no particular way to sequence these chemotherapies, despite what experts would have you to believe. There's really no data to show how you should sequence these particular treatments. But the idea is pretty simple. You want to show the cancer different methods of attack. If it's figured out a drug from one class, you want to use a different class, right? You want to show this cancer a different mechanism of attack. So let's get into your personalized journey now. Let's talk about the bullets in the gun. Let's talk about this approach. Let's start playing chess against your cancer. So we're going to focus on this first line treatment, the first treatment you're going to get. And we're going to look at kind of the broad bullets that are in your gun. So we talk about the bullets in the gun. We say, okay, we know we're going to use chemotherapy. We might use immunotherapy, which we're going to talk about in a moment. We want to really explore molecular-based options. So make sure you have that molecular-based testing. And we really want to focus on clinical trials. These are the four primary bullets in your guns. These are the broad classes. Now, what I did for you here is I tried to give you the general approach, my approach, and what 
oftentimes is used by experts, okay? So the general approach as the first shot that you take against patient's cancer, the first line treatment, is that we typically use chemotherapy, okay? And we use immune therapy if your cancer has a pdl one production 10% or more, right? Or it's MSI high or it's TMB high. You can reference this later, but we will use immune therapy if it has any of these characteristics, pdl one above 10%, MSI high or TMB high. If it does not, then we will use chemotherapy alone. So there are different chemotherapy options. There's a ton. Many people like to use carboplatin and gemcitabine. That's my preferred approach. It's two different drugs. I get to attack the cancer in two ways. That's my preferred approach. But a lot of people will use Taxol. A lot of people will use Abraxane. A lot of people will use Zolota. And a lot of people will use a drug called Aribulin. There's no right or wrong answer here. I'm just trying to prepare you for what you might see. They might use some other chemotherapy options, the ones we just talked about. But this is in general what people will use. If they use immune therapy, most people, are going to use Keytruda, okay? If your PDL one is 10% or more, they're gonna use Keytruda. There are other drugs you can use if your MSI high or TMB high, like Dostarlamab, but at the moment, I just want you thinking about Keytruda in this context. So as we said, chemotherapy is generally used in the frontline approach. There are many correct choices. Immune therapy will likely be used if you make PDL one 10% or more, and the juice to squeeze ratio varies. So every chemotherapy is different. They have very different side effect profiles. And I'm not going to go over that today. I'm not going to go everything, every, through every single chemotherapy and their side effects. Your physician, your nurses, your nurse practitioners, your physician assistants will do a very good job of walking you through the side effects. And at some point, we'll do that probably later in this series. But I want you to appreciate that every treatment is different. Every chemotherapy is a different side effect profile. It's given differently. And so just appreciate that the juice to squeeze ratio will, diff, will vary. Now, when we talk about chemotherapy specifically, the side effects will depend on the chemotherapy use. There are some chemotherapies where you don't lose your hair, right? Zolota, gemcitabine, those are drugs where you don't necessarily lose your hair. There are other chemotherapies where you definitely will lose your hair, like adriamycin, Taxol, and the like. So the side effects depend on the chemotherapy being used. They are generally given in the IV, either through a Metaport or through a peripheral line, generally a Metaport, right? And the idea here is that we give them in a particular schedule and the schedule differs based on the chemotherapy you're getting. So every chemotherapy is very unique. Now, Zolota is a drug that we give orally, but in general, chemotherapy is IV. It's often given without other chemotherapy, but some combinations are used. I just talked about how I like to use in the first line approach, the first approach, I like to use two drugs, carboplatin and gemcitabine to attack the cancer in two ways, but there's no right or wrong answer. Immune therapy, we typically use Keytruda, if your PDL one is 10% or more, I keep hitting, I keep uh, beating that, beating that drum. But the idea is pretty simple. It's really important to think about PDL one status and to think about Keytruda if you have cancer that makes PDL one and 10% or more of the cells. The side effects of Keytruda, right, of immune therapy in general, is that when we rev up your immune system, your immune system can attack you, and that's really the concern of immunotherapy side effects, as you can see here. Now, I want everyone to appreciate that immune therapy is generally very well tolerated. It's incredibly safe. I would not hesitate to give immune therapy to someone who's 100 years old, as long as there wasn't other reasons not to. So immune therapy is incredibly well tolerated. The problem is when it goes bad, it can go bad because your immune system can really attack you, right? We're stimulating your immune system to attack cancer, but your immune system can inadvertently start to attack you. If it attacks your colon, you can get diarrhea and abdominal pain. If it attacks your lungs, you can get shortness of breath and a cough. If it attacks your kidneys, you can get kidney failure, pancreas, diabetes, thyroid. You can get low thyroid hormone production. I actually see this quite often where it's to give you thyroid hormone because the immune therapy is attacking your thyroid. If it attacks your liver, your liver enzymes can go out of, out of whack. Your liver can be dysfunctional. But the idea is immune therapy in general is pretty safe. These side effects are seen at a relatively low rate. It's say roughly 5 to 10% or less. Much of the, many of these are much less, diabetes much less than 1%, kidney failure much less than 1%. But the idea is that you have to be vigilant. You have to be hyper vigilant. You have to tell us everything. If you're getting immune therapy and you have diarrhea, you can't ignore that. You just can't ignore that. You have to let us know because if you let that diarrhea fester, if you let the immune system continue to attack your colon, that can really manifest as a significant problem later. So you need to let us know early if you have any of these symptoms, why I talked about it, right? In general, immune therapy is very, very well tolerated. 
but you need to be on the lookout for these symptoms. So after we've given you chemotherapy plus minus immune therapy, we typically do it for say three to four cycles, roughly two to three months. Then we see how we're doing, right? Then you're going to get a scan, right? So we're going to compare the scan, the new scan to the one before we started using the treatment. That's how we'll know if it's working. In addition, we will sometimes follow cancer markers in your blood. So sometimes breast cancer cells make two markers, a marker called CA15-3 and a marker called CA2729 that you can find in the blood. And the higher the level, typically the more cancer there is out there. And what you want to see is if the treatment's going well, the cancer marker will go down, right? Because there's less cells to make those cancer markers. So we do imaging, either a PET CT or a CT and a bone scan. And we oftentimes follow markers in the blood. Now, this is a little controversial. Some people do not. They do not have to. I like to do it. But with that said, just appreciate you typically get two to three months of treatment, and then we're going to reassess how you're doing. We're going to assess the response. We want to know if it's working or not. If it's not working, we're going to switch. If it is working, we're probably going to continue doing the same treatment. And to that end, if it ain't broke, we don't typically fix it, right? We typically go back to the well again and again, as long as you're handling the treatment, as long as you haven't had too much of it, right? There's certain treatments that only give six cycles of like carboplatin. But the idea is if it ain't broke, we don't typically fix it. However, if the cancer is progressing, then we will show the cancer something different. And we go right back to this notion of different classes of chemo that attack the cancer in different ways. So if you've figured out this class, for example, we may use this class or this class or this class. But the idea is we're not gonna use this same class, right? If you figure this out, it's unlikely we're gonna use this drug. That would be a little bit strange. So the bottom line is you're going to get your cancer reassessed every two to three months and based on that reassessment, we're either going to continue doing the same treatment or we're going to change it. So this is an example of someone who we were following their CA15-3. This is actually a patient with HER2 positive breast cancer. But right here, you can see the cancer basically appeared. That's when we found it. And you see the cancer mark was roughly 230, 240. And the idea here is that it should be less than roughly 35. And so the cancer marker was elevated because the 15-3 was being, CA15-3 was being made by the cancer cells and secreted into the blood. So we could find it in the blood. So when we started treatment, that cancer marker came all the way down and her scans actually looked really good. Her cancer was no longer visible. She was in complete remission. So we're going to follow this cancer marker to make sure it is in the right place. So just to kind of send that message home a little bit more, we will do imaging before and after treatment. And if it looks like this, if things look amazing and things are much better, we will likely just continue the same treatment. However, if we do the scan and things look like they progressed, so in this case, the liver looks a little bit worse, there's two new spots here, then we're gonna change the treatment. So just appreciate that roughly every two to three months, we're gonna repeat your scans, we're gonna follow your cancer markers, and we're gonna make changes or stay on the same course based on that. Really simple. That's what your future looks like. We're gonna give you a treatment, choose a treatment, we're going to do scans every two to three months and do the cancer markers to see if it's working. And then we're going to reassess. And it's that simple. So let's say your cancer has figured out the first shot we took. Well, then we go to the second line approach. So we've gone through the first line, your cancer progressed on it, or you no longer can handle it. So then we look at second line sorts of processes, right? So now we go to the second line approach. So the standard second line approach would be chemotherapy, but a different one than the, the, the one you got initially, right? We're using a different class of chemotherapy. We're not going to use the same class. That doesn't make sense. Your cancer already figured that out, right? So we're going to use a different class of chemotherapy. We'll use immune therapy if it wasn't used initially. And if your cancer has the right criteria, now don't worry about this. Most people are going to use the immune therapy up front. So it's not really that important, but we're going to use chemotherapy. Okay. Now I want to say something here. I should have said it initially when we're talking about first line therapy. It's very important to talk about clinical trials, molecular-based profiling, or options and local regional options at every single visit. Really, clinical trials and molecular pro profiling. Is there something there that you can use to attack the cancer that's better than the classic chemotherapies? That's really important. In fact, I would say it's just as important in first line, second line, third line, every single time you're gonna ask about this. That's really, really important, okay? Don't be surprised if your doctor says, you know what, we're not gonna do chem the classic chemotherapy initially, we're gonna put you on a clinical trial right away. In fact, that would be beautiful right? So that's what you want to be thinking about. That's why I put it here. Now, let's say there's no clinical trial option. Let's say there's no molecular-based option, right? Then my typical approach is to use a drug called sasituzumab, drug called Tridelity, okay? This is a good drug. 
it's likely the most effective option out there just based on data. Again, take that with a grain of salt, but I like to use it here. Now, other people might use a different chemotherapy or they might use it here. So I'm just kind of trying to show you what other people might do. The bottom line is chemotherapy is generally used in the second line setting, but different than the first one. There are many correct choices. Immune therapy will likely be used if your PL one's above 10% and you didn't get it before. They won't use it again if you already got it. And the juice to squeeze ratio varies. Again, with chemotherapy, the juice to squeeze ratio always varies. So again, we do the response assessment. We check the scans, we check the cancer markers. And then if your cancer has progressed, we go to the third shot. And in fact, I'm just gonna do them all at, one, all at once now, third shot onward. But the bottom line is, we will again use a chemotherapy, but we'll use different chemotherapy than the cancer's already seen, different class. So we're constantly thinking about what does the cancer seem? What is it figured out? How do I attack it in a different way? And that's the idea. And so for me, I typically like to use a drug called Zalota here. It's an oral pill if, only if, there's no good clinical trial and there's no good molecular-based option. Again, right away, I mean, every single time you're talking to your doctor, clinical trial, molecular-based option, clinical trial, molecular-based option. I want you to be a broken record. I want you to always ask about it. Okay, because it's really important in stage four triple negative breast cancer. Now, people might use a different sort of chemotherapy. There are other options that you can look at from what I showed you earlier, but the bottom line is chemotherapy, again, is likely going to be used. It's going to be a different chemotherapy than what your cancer's already seen. So generally used, but different than first line, many correct choices. The juice to squeeze ratio varies and clinical trials are imperative. They are always imperative. The very first moment you hear that you have stage four triple negative breast cancer, two reflexes, well, three reflexes. Show me my scans. What are the clinical trials? What's the molecular based profile? That's it. Three straight questions for your physician as a reflex. I don't even want you to think about it. I just want reflexively to ask those questions. Again, response assessment, we go to fourth line if you need to, but the bottom line is this is what your overall journey looks like. I know it looked really complicated when I presented this, but you just saw it. Everything was really simple. It's basically chemotherapy plus minus immune therapy, chemotherapy, chemotherapy. Always think about clinical trials, always think about molecular based options, and there's different chemotherapy options that you can use. That's essentially it. It's really not that complicated. So the last thing I want to talk about, and I say this every single time that I present in this particular series, is that there are some unique situations we need to consider. One of those unique situations is if your cancer is in your bones, right? So in this patient who has cancer up and down the spine in various bones, we typically will do a couple of things here. Number one, if there's a lot of pain associated with one of these locations, we will likely use radiation to try and treat it. In addition, if there's no contraindication, there's no reason not to, like if you don't have huge dental issues, we will typically use bone protective agents. We can use a drug called Zometa. A lot of us like to use a drug called Denosumab, otherwise known as Dexgeva. But the bottom line is we're giving you drugs to try and prevent fractures related to the cancer in your bones. Now, the big side effect of these drugs is that they can cause osteonecrosis of the jaw, basically make the jaw disintegrate in roughly two to 3% of people, and it's typically people with dental issues, which is why we oftentimes want you to see your dentist before we start these drugs. In addition, they can cause your calcium to go down and they can cause atypical fractures, which is a little strange, but the bottom line is these drugs are generally incredibly safe, but you will likely hear your oncologist ask you to see a dentist first. What I really want you to take home from this though, is if you have cancer in the bones, you are likely going to get a drug to protect your bones. If that has not come up, please ask your doctor about it. Say, hey, I saw that the cancer was in my bones. Are you gonna give me a drug to protect me from fracture? Now, aside from bone metastases, I wanna talk about brain metastases. So if there's cancer in your brain, like in this person who has a couple of spots in their brain, many of the drugs we use, in terms of chemotherapy, basically that we give IV or we give by mouth, do not cross the blood brain barrier. So they can't get from the blood into the brain. So they typically do not work on metastases in the brain. So oftentimes we have to resort to radiation to treat patients with cancer in the brain. Now what's nice is we do have pinpoint radiation, which we call stereotactic radiosurgery or cyberknife, that can deliver high doses of radiation to small areas of the brain to prevent damage to the areas surrounding the cancer lesion. So that's nice. You will oftentimes hear patient, people talk about stereotactic radiosurgery or cyberknife to treat patients with cancer in the brain. However, if there's a lot of cancer in the brain, it's basically diffuse, 
We sometimes do whole brain radiation therapy where we radiate the entire brain at once. But the bottom line is radiation is very important if you have cancer in the brain. In addition, sometimes you'll hear your cancer doctor use a pill called Zolota. That's a chemotherapy that does cross the blood brain barrier to try and help in a situation like this if you've not already had it. Bottom line here is if you have brain metastases or bone metastases over unique situations, come back to the slide, reference it, and just appreciate that this is likely what's going to happen. Concluding remarks. I always say this every single talk. Do not be shy. Be loud. Ask to see your scans. Ask about clinical trials. Ask about molecular profiling. You need to really be your own advocate. You might actually save your own life. I mean, your oncologist is probably phenomenal, so this is probably not an issue. But at the same time, this will help you understand your disease. It'll help you understand what to look for. And it, it allow you to be a, like your own advocate, to really have some control in this process, which I think people are striving for. Just ask, again, like I said, to see your molecular profile, your scans, clinical trials. The journey may be different, but the thought process is the same. So everyone has a kind of a distinct journey, but this underlying thought process of playing chess against cancer is the same. The inches matter. So again, make sure if you're on immune therapy, you're talking about every single side effect, you're on chemotherapy and you sense that something is awry, make sure you're calling your doctor. Again, I've always said this before, but I'm going to say it again. You can never call me too much, but you can call too little. If you sit on a symptom for even an hour, it can be the difference between life and death. So make sure you are calling your cancer doctor if you have any concerns. I don't care about whether or not they're at home with their family. They, they're responsible to you, that matters. They have to take care of you in your worst moments and sometimes that's not convenient for the cancer doctor, it does not matter. Make sure you call them. Come back here for reference if you need it. That's why I made the slides the way I did. Please reference them if you need it. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time. I will open it up to questions. All right. Awesome, I have a two questions. Oh yeah, go for it. How do you know what is the right clinical trial for you and what would be the best case scenario coming out of a clinical trial? Oh, that's such a good question, Ollie. So I have a bunch of ways that I think about clinical trials when I'm considering what clinical trial to put my patient on. I think about a number of different things. I won't disclose all of them today because that's part of what my company does. And I kind of want to keep that on the, you know, in the down low. But when all is said and done, you look at the standard of care arm. So, you know, let's say there's a clinical trial where 50% of patients get drug A and 50% do not. You want to look at the 50% that do not, and you want to make sure they're still getting the standard of care, like the type of quality care that you'd want to give someone in who has stage four triple negative breast cancer. So you'd want to look at the, the standard of care and make sure it wasn't a deficient standard of care, right? The second thing you'll look at is you'll say, okay, what's the mechanism of action of this drug that they're using? Is it similar to other drugs I can already give the patient that are already available? Well, that clinical trial is not going to really move the needle, right? So I'm always thinking about my patients in terms of whether or not they're my mom, dad, brother, sister, child, right? That's how I think about it. And so I'm always thinking, okay, how do I move the needle here? I don't really care about incremental change. I don't care about drugs that are copycat drugs where I can already give them a drug with the same mechanism that's likely going to have the same sort of response. I want something novel, something that's transformative or potentially transformative. So I think that way, Ollie, a little bit, I think about what's the mechanism of action here? Has this cancer seen it? And I also think about what previous trials were done regarding that mechanism of action, right? If you have a novel mechanism of action, but there's a lot of trials that were done before and they've all failed, well, that's probably not going to be that useful. So I think about a lot of things. That's just a small part of what I think about. But every oncologist is different. Some oncologists, you know, might just put them on a trial because it's convenient. It's where they, what they have at their institution. They may not have thought the way I think. They may have a paper that comes out of it. You know, there's a lot of things that go into how oncologists decide which trials they want to use for their patients. I very much don't care about the institution, don't care about the company, don't care about anything but the patient. So I'm typically thinking about what's the standard of care? What's the mechanism of action? Does this really move the needle? Does it have a chance to move the needle? That's how I think. And then in terms of the second question, like what's the optimal response to a clinical trial? Well, clearly the disease going away, like complete remission, right? That's what we all want. That's the best case scenario for a clinical trial. So complete remission with minimal toxicity, right? That's the holy grail. As you can imagine, Ollie, you get, you know, cancer goes away and the drug doesn't hurt patient patients. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ollie. Great, great questions. Anyone else? Okay. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. We'll post this online. That concludes breast cancer. We will go to 
either lung cancer or glioblastoma multiforma next week. But thank everyone for their time and, and thank you for being here. Please take care. Thank, thank you, you Basin. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.